Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the PGS this morning. This is probably our seventh in the series that we organized uh, starting from August this semester. So thank you for your very active participation. Um, so today, it's my pleasure to introduce the speaker this morning. Uh, the topic is right there in front of you, components of a research paper. It will be presented by or facilitated by our speaker, uh, Mr. Jeffrey Mock. He's a lecturer at CELC, the Center for English Language Communication. Uh, he has just, I think, uh, submitted a dissertation to a university in the UK. Uh, his PhD is in the area of education. Okay? Maybe he'll tell you more about it later. So uh, he's, he's likely to get his uh, doctoral degree in early 2012. Uh, before that, uh, you know, he, he's in the past worked in Japan uh, for about six years, is that six years, um, helping students with their learning, um, you know, writing research papers, theses, and stuff like that. Uh, he has published a number of articles in journals, and in fact, he has won uh, best paper awards for for his articles and so on. So. He may be a little late in the business, as he himself puts it, but I think he's going to uh, show a very, very strong performance down the years. So that, that's one, one, one thing. And um, his research interests are in the areas of e-learning, English as foreign language, and problem-based learning. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Jeffrey uh, this morning. Thank you. Test my voice. Uh, can you hear me at the back, or do you think I need the microphone? Microphone? You know, sometimes the microphone distorts the voice. Yeah. I may become. I may sound. Oh, yeah, there we go. I may sound a bit different. Is it okay? Maybe the microphone is good, so everyone gets to hear me. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. Um, as uh, la last. Last, okay. Uh, said that uh, I just finished my uh, uh, doctorate degree, uh, so I think you you probably caught me at a good time because I just finished it. I went for my Viva. I don't know whether you're familiar with the Viva. I think in Singapore there's also a Viva if you're doing a uh, PhD, uh, master's degrees. Of course, the theses don't need a Viva. So I just finished it just oh, two weeks ago, in fact, and so I'm as fresh as you can be in terms of. Uh, what they call uh, having been uh, doctored, you know. Yeah, you just finish your, your, your huge amount of work and then you sit in front of two examiners, trembling in, a, in your fingers, wondering what's going to ask, what kind of questions, what kind of uh, interrogation they'll give you. And by the way, in UK, the doctoral degree, uh, the viva is the deal breaker. Do you know what I mean? It's a deal breaker. That means you pass or fail at the Viva. So I understand in Singapore it's not the case. In fact, you're given a lot of uh, feedback before the Viva itself. But in UK, the Viva is the deal breaker. You make it or you break it at the Viva. In America, you call it uh, oral defense. But uh, in the UK, you sit in front of two examiners, one internal of the university and an external one. And then you defend your thesis. And so they'll, they'll, they'll ask questions. And so, yeah, um, I passed. I was so happy, of course. Uh, you know, after they grill you, and then they ask you to go out, please, while we deliberate over your, uh, your performance at the Viva. And then after a while, they call you back in. And of course, you know, once they call you back in, you look at their faces, try to read whether, you know, was, is it good or bad. And then when they stuck their hands out and said, congratulations, I said, oh, a load off my shoulder. Okay, so I hope the same will go for you guys. I think I understand. Oops. I understand that many of us. This is the problem with microphones. I understand that the microphone is. Okay, I understand. <laughs> okay, it's where? It's my hair. It's the moving. I shouldn't move too much. He says. Okay. I didn't move at all. <laughs> Okay, all right. I understand that many of us here uh, are postgraduate uh, students here, yeah? Can I, can, I, can I have a show of hands to, to find out um, how many of us are doing master's uh, level at this point of time? Okay, 
So I'm going to, in my talk, I'm going to refer to a bit on the master's level. Uh, just to let you know, I did two programs, two master's programs. Nothing, nothing to brag about, but it's just that I've gone through the torture and the struggles, and uh, I can understand what it means to go through the program. And how many of us are doing the doctorate program, the PhD? And Oh, okay, sizable crowd, okay. So you're in the throes of your, I don't know, is it, are you happy doing it? Are you struggling? Are you enjoying it? Yeah. Uh, they say research is the engine, the engine, you know, of your PhD, or master's for that matter even. The research part is the main thing. Okay, I'm going to talk a bit about that later on. But, uh, but today, uh, my talk is it's clearly, it's on the research paper per se, but... I won't walk, walk too much, okay? But, but uh, I'm going to allude many of my points to uh, your master's th uh, thesis that you're, gonna, you're writing, and as well as your doctorate uh, thesis gonna you're going to write. Uh, so in that sense, uh, uh, you can ask questions regarding about your thesis, about writing, about how you organize it, how you structure it. Uh, I would like this to be a bit more interactive if possible, but there's a big crowd here, so it might be a bit difficult. But I'm going, to give, I'm going to open pockets of time for us to ask questions. Okay, so when, when the time comes, you can please uh, you can ask questions. Okay? Um, okay, let's, let's move this along. Can I? Can I? No? Okay. So today my talk is about, um, I think it's listed in, in, the, uh, in, the, in, a, in a brief, the rationale, purpose, and significance of research. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about research paradigms. I think this is more pertinent to the PhD students. Uh, the master's program, this is not so much a key issue, but, but still, for those who are doing doctor programs, this is a key issue and methodology. And literature review and discussion, I'm going to talk about a bit about that and the writing style and register. Okay? This is no good, huh? Is it, is it disturbing you guys? Maybe I'll use the, uh, the other one. Yeah. Crackling voices. Turn this off. So I'll, I'm going to be arranged here. So, is this better? Hello, testing. Hold it. Uh. I don't like the hold. Because when I hold it, I cannot move my arms. Is this better? Okay. Can you hear me? No. All right. Sorry about that. You know how IT is? Sometimes it's... Uh, oh. Okay. Disclaimer. I thought this is important. Because uh, even though I'm going to talk about research writing, uh, I'm going to cover only general tips and points that is applicable to everybody as much as I can. Um, the reason being, as I put down here, different fields have different emphasis. I'll give an example, literature review. I've, I've done some editing and looking at some scientific papers. Literature review is very scant or almost minimized. Whereas for the social sciences, it tends to be a bit more. In fact, there's a whole chapter dedicated for lit review. So uh, that's just something about, I thought, you need to know. Different fields requires different kind of uh, treatment to the different components that I'm going to talk about. Maybe by a show of hands, how many of us here are from the uh, hard sciences? That means the natural science, the physical science uh, uh, area. How many of us? Oh, okay. So because I come from a social science background, so in that sense, my talk will be more geared towards that. So I hope you can uh, understand a bit and appreciate that I will not talk too much about the uh, hard sciences. Uh, but it looks like most of us are from the social sciences background, so that's pretty good. Or at least the, uh, not the soft side, if you like. Okay. Um, oh, hang on. Okay, one more thing. Your supervisor, that's the key person. Uh, in any kind of research, well, if you're writing a research paper, you don't really have a supervisor. It's just yourself. But you, all, you can always count on a peer to do review for you. But 
But when you're doing a PhD, a doctor program, and a master's thesis, your supervisor is key. He's the guy. Okay? Listen to him. He's going to tell you what's, what should be here, what should not be here, uh, included in your thesis, what should be excluded. You have to watch and listen and uh, follow his instructions to the T. Okay? Uh, I had a very good supervisor. Um, he really prepared me well in the sense that uh, all the, the chapters that I, I sent it to him to, to, to review, he looked at it, he criticized it. He gave me a hard time, actually. In fact, at some points, I was even like, what am I doing this? You know, I wish I could give up, you know. But, but when, you, when, when he comes back with a criticism, he comes back with a feedback, you have to take it, and any feedback is good feedback. Because at the end of the day, it helps to shape your thesis, your writing, to be, to be solid, to be good, to be uh, compact and tight. So that when you come to the viva, when you come to the examiner, when you look at it, it's, it's, it's a breeze. In fact, I was so pleased uh, when I sat down for my viva, the first thing the two examiners said to me is that we enjoyed reading your thesis. Wow. Now that's another sign that, they, that you've done, I mean, you have written well. Everything was well structured and well uh, positioned so that uh, the examiners had no problem understanding what you're writing. Okay? So that's your supervisor. He's the key guy, uh, key person in your, in your thesis. So whatever I say today, if your supervisor uh, contradict me, listen to him or her. <laughs> okay? So today is just my take on uh, how to write a good uh, uh, research. I seem to have problems trying to move this along. I move up, right? Two down, all right. Sorry about that. Okay. What is research? I think you probably know a bit about this, but I thought I want to cover this. It's a system, uh, systematization of curiosity. I think all of you started with some kind of interest, some curiosity about some kind of uh, 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 phenomena, if you like, in your area, in your field. And take it from me, you have to sustain that interest. If you're doing something you're not interested in, you will not last. Okay? It's got to be something that you're deeply interested in, that you want to do research in. And this will sustain you and keep you going. Because you're doing something you're not interested in and it's because someone said you should do or do research on, on it, then I can tell you that you're going to struggle with it. Because along the way, when you collect the data, when you go to analyze it, when you try to churn out the data, churn out your findings, you're going to find yourself, oh no, what am I doing? You know, because you don't really have the interest in it. So that's something that you need to take note of. Uh, I don't know which stage of your, of your thesis you're at, but... Uh, this is something that uh, it's, it's important to know. And the other thing is, uh, sy uh, it's a systematic process of inquiry of three elements. And what are these three elements? I keep doing this wrong thing, eh? <laughs> three elements is this. The question. What is your research question? What is burning inside you? What is it you want to find out? What are you researching in? Your problem, your hypothesis that you have, that is key. One of the key elements. The second thing, of course, is your data that you collect, and that's going to be a lot of it for some of us who collect data, uh, whether it is quantitative or qualitative. Okay? Uh, so this is the second element, and the third one is really the analysis and interpretation of these data that you have. Okay? So these are the three elements. However, whatever it is, at whatever stage you are in, always bear in mind one thing. Your research, your thesis, what you're writing, it's really telling a story. That's what I've been told. It tells a story. What you're doing, it must present an argument. An argument about what you're researching in. In other words, if I don't see an argument, in fact, that's the, one of the questions that my, my examiners ask me. What is your argument? What are you arguing for in your thesis? And you have to be crystal clear about why are you doing this? What is your argument? What is the point you're making? Whether it's a testing of a hypothesis, it is still an argument. Okay? Sorry, again. Okay. So let's talk about the components of a research paper. Does it make any sense? Okay, I know. This is actually, uh, I put it up here just to show you something. What, what do you think this is? <laughs> you kind of like know what it is. The, the, the women will know what it is. 
Even some of the guys who are interested in cooking will know what it is. This is a recipe, okay? This is not a components of a research paper. Half a chicken, cut into pieces, two potatoes, 60 grams of chicken curry powder. I love chicken curry, by the way. So that's why I put it up here. Why I put this recipe up here? Because every time my wife cooks or bakes, usually for the first time, she will have the recipe in front of her. And she'll follow it. You know, she'll go back and look at it and then prepare the stuff. Go back and look at it. Okay, half a teaspoon. Okay. You go back to your recipe to look and prepare the dish. Whether it's a cake you're baking or a dish you are making, you always go back to the recipe. If you're doing it the first time or the second time for that matter, you go back to the recipe. And for the same thing, in any thesis writing, you go back to the recipe. What kind of recipe? The recipe for a good dish. Sorry, a good thesis. Okay? And what is this recipe, if you like? Now, this is what I've been taught. This is what I, I, I go by. Two, four, six. Six items. In fact, some of us who are in the social sciences, especially in the educational side, you will find that this neatly fits into six chapters. Okay? Six chapters. Uh, like I said, different fields probably have different lengths, different word count for different chapters or different parts of the component, but essentially this is what uh, it calls for. Okay? First is the statement of the research problem. Clearly, you need to set this up. Okay? The statement of the research. What is the research problem you are encountering? What is it that you are talking about? In fact, this is where you start your argument. This is where you start arguing for, the, for, for, your, for your case. Okay, I'll talk a bit more about that. Then you go to the lit review, which I'll go to mention about that later on. Talk a bit more about that. And then you go on to your methodology and then the research design. Okay? I think you all know what methodology is, how you went about or how you're going to go about collecting your data. And then your data analysis and then presenting your findings and then a whole chapter on discussion and then finally, your conclusion with your implications and recommendations. So these are all the elements, if you like, on components of a good research paper. In fact, when I review, I do, I'm an editor for some uh, a journal, and also I review articles, research articles for that matter. I look at all these things. Do you have all these things in place? If not, then it suffers. Okay? And I'm talking about research with data or data, if you like. There are some papers that do not have data, philosophical debate or discussion, uh, the kind of papers. Those are different. Those are theoretical papers. But what I'm talking about today is paper that has to do with uh, collection, collecting and analyzing data. Okay? So, which I think is where all of us are at or are interested in. So today, I'm going to talk about the first three only in much more detail than the others. Although I'll just also mention the, re the rest uh, just to put everything into perspective. So that's your recipe. That is the uh, components of a, a research paper. Now, I want to start with looking at the statement of research problem. Can you take a look at this? I took this from a very good research paper. Okay, this is not a thesis. Okay, this is a good research paper. Just take a couple of minutes to read this. And I want to ask you to look or tell me or see what do you think is the research aims, the purpose. Okay. Just a couple of minutes, take a look at it. Do you think it's clear? Do you think the research aims and purpose is clearly stated? Yes, kind of. Where is it? Okay. You, I, th I think you can put it. I'm going I'm to just show you. Oh. It's going to be, it's actually at uh, where? Two, four, six. Where is it? This article focuses on why and how they inter internationalize and explore through case studies the concept of internationalization. That is the line, that is the statement 
Okay. Now, in any article, in any research paper, it has to be explicit. You can't do it implicit. You can't do it hidden. You can't let the reader guess or try to infer what is your research aim, purpose. You can't do that because you know why? There are just so many papers that a person has to read, a reviewer reads or goes through. You have to be explicit about it. And there is a line or a statement or a sentence for you to make that clear. And you have to, got, you have to put that in somewhere either in the first paragraph or the second paragraph of your introduction. So that is a statement of the research problem. And in fact, when you look at the, the sentence itself, you can see even it, it tells you what method this person uses through case studies. This paper is about case studies, which you can see at the end. This article begins with a brief definition of the, of the definitions of the ter term provided by scholars before describing the case methodology, you see. Again, it's all very explicitly stated. And that's how I wrote my thesis. It's all very clearly stated at each point, at each chapter, at each paragraph. In fact, it should be structured and even outlined to help the reader understand what you're saying. And some of us may not be very good at English or the written language. All the more, an explicitly stated statement will help the reader understand what you are doing. So there's no compromise in this area. In fact, my supervisor was telling me, where is your statement? I don't see it, he says. You gotta make it clear. Because the person who is going to examine you is not going to try, to try to guess and try to figure out what is your research aim, purpose. Okay? So, in one sense, if you read earlier on that, that, that chapter, it will tell you all these things. In fact, that whole section, it's a research paper and it's the introduction. Okay? So it should tell you the rationale of the study, why you're doing this. The statement of the problem, which I told you, the sentence you have to say, the statement of purpose, and the research questions. Now, in social sciences, research questions are important. Okay? Uh, it should be at the back of your mind all the time when you write. In fact, in every chapter, you start with your research questions. I'm going to talk a bit more about that. That is almost like your... I'm going to talk a bit more about... It's almost like your... Uh, uh, what do you call that? Something that you hold on to all the time. Okay? And then significance and the outline of the rest of the paper. Okay. Here we go. Okay, this is what I wanted to tell you. Okay? So here is the clearly stated statement of research problem. Uh, the first line really gives you the background. Okay? Universities are increasingly internationalizing, so we want to talk about this term, okay, and uh, it goes on, okay, so, like I said earlier on, your statement of purpose and your research question, okay, this is the same research paper, take a look at this, the way he or she phrased it, or to this two person actually, the main research question guiding the study was, see, so clear, telling the reader what guided me when I wrote this paper. What is the part played by interna internationalization in the functioning of the two case universities, one in UK and the other one in Hong Kong? Discussion will fo focus on the following specific questions. Okay? What does interna internationalization mean to the two case universities? What are the opportunities? So on and so forth. So, from a main research question, it branched out into small, specific, smaller research questions. Because by answering the specific questions, it answers the main question. Okay. Now, I mentioned to you before the statement problem, the research question, the aim and purpose. It's almost like this. Okay, I'm going to hold out this thing. Do you know what this is? Obviously, you know what this is, right? This is the ruler. Okay? And this is really, really your statement of the problem. This is also your research question. You know why? Because this is a ruler. 
the very same thing that they use, you use to write your thesis is the very same thing they will use to measure your thesis. They will ask themselves when they read your thesis, are you answering your research questions? Are you answering or testing your hypothesis well enough? Are you fulfilling the aim that you set forth in your introduction chapter? Are you, have you achieved your purpose of your research? So the same paper, the same ruler they, you put forth, the same set. No, you can't have too many. No, there's another one here. Okay? If you have too many research questions, if you have too many main research questions, if you like, or you have too, too many aims or too many purposes, it becomes very confusing. Which one should the examiner use? Okay? So in one sense, you have to be very clear what is your only one statement of purpose, your statement of problem, your, your, your aim, and your research question. That's the key thing. In fact, every time when I went back to my supervisor, he always asked me, how does this answer your research question? How does this compare with the lit review to your research question? He always go back to that. And because that is your driving force. This is the ruler, this is the thing that your examiners will use to check and to measure how well you did. Okay? So I thought, I thought I'll show you this because it's more like a visual thing. You know, at the end of the day, you won't remember anything I said. Do you know about this thing? About this uh, interesting thing that survey they did? You remember only 10% of what is spoken. <gasps> Shock and horror. Yeah. But what you see, you probably remember better. I can bet you next week, if I were to ask you, what did I say? You're like scratching your head. I, I think you say a few things here and there. 10%. But did you remember me waving this ruler? Yes, of course. It's a visual thing anyway, by the way. This is part of learning. Visual helps you to remember things much better. Okay? So, there you go. Alright? You begin with arguing for your research by stating your research problem, what you are researching as to why you're doing it, and like a story, you know, you set your argument, your thesis. Okay? So, I'm going to move a bit about significance. Now, we've covered all these things in general. Okay? I hope you've managed to get some points uh, that is uh, crucial or meaningful to you in your, in your thesis development. But the next point I thought is interesting is significance. This is part of your chapter one, in fact. Introduction. Significance. What is this? Now, when I sat in my viver, the external examiner, which actually the waiting he actually has more say in whether I pass or fail because he's outside, external examiner from another university. So he asked me this question. He said, and before he said that, he said, now, I'm going to give you the $64 million question. And I was scratching my head. What do you mean a $64 million question? What is this $64 million question? Actually, what it, uh, do you know the, 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 the phrase, $64 million question? That means the most important question of all. And he said, what is the significance of your findings. What is the significance? What is the use of your findings? After you've done all... How many years? I don't know how many years you've done. Your findings, you've concluded your stuff. What is the significance? What use is it? So I thought this is pretty important for us to understand. And you should, you, you should allude to that in your introduction. What is the significance of your research? What help, what kind of contribution will it do to your field, for example? How does it add to the body of knowledge in your area? What practical use, which will come in later on in your final chapter, the implications and recommendations, but at this point, you should allude to that. You should point to that, almost like a signpost. Perhaps this is all, ah, these are the significances. And that's why I'm doing this. That's why I'm launching into this research. It is not just for research's sake. It's not for fun, but it's for something that is of use to the society, to the body of knowledge, to the, to the, to the, to the field. Okay? So, I thought this is interesting. Now, this is a hypothesis. 
Tomato plants exhibit a higher rate of growth when planted in compost rather than a soil. Now, that's a hypothesis, yeah? Some of you on our natural sciences and hard sciences, those are bi what, uh, agriculture? <laughs> I don't think it's agriculture in Singapore, is it? But anyway, you, you will find this is a hypothesis. But then the question is, what significance is this? What is the use of this hypothesis? What is the use of testing this hypothesis? Now, if you ask me, the examiner could ask you, look, I can ask this hypothesis. I can also do this hypothesis. I can also ask this also. So there are a lot of hypotheses that you can set yourself. But why is compost so important? That's the first one. That's the one you set. Why is this better or why is this more important to you than the others? So I think at the onset, at the first chapter in your introduction, you are already setting this for people to understand the significance of your research. Okay? Okay. So, here, I want to go back to that uh, paragraph that this person who wrote this article he says here, the article begins with a brief review of definitions of the term provided by the scholars before describing the case, methodology, and key findings. <clears throat> so he, he moves on. Okay. Uh, so the checklist for any kind of a research problem is really this. Why are you doing this? How important is this? How significant? Is this, and is this going to be an issue for some time to come? Now, if your issue, if your problem is going to be a sustained problem, your research is significant, it's important. If it's something that's going to last a fad, well, we don't know, we're not sure. <clears throat> so in one sense, you really have to ask yourself these questions when you talk about the significance of your research. Okay, how important is this to the field? to your body of knowledge that you're looking at. Okay. Now this is where I thought um, I want to spend a short time yeah, it's about half an hour already to ask you to look at your own uh, research problem. Okay. You have I think when you came in you have this paper, right? Activity one, I'd like you to spend just five minutes or maybe less, less, less than that, or just five minutes looking at this page. I want you to think about your problem statement, your research question, your hypothesis. I want you to think about it and ask yourself, check yourself with these three questions that I wrote here. And also the, those questions that are listed here too, they are the similar questions. Okay? Now you can turn to your neighbor to talk if you want. Uh, just to share your research statement or problem. Okay? So I'd like to spend this time, just five minutes, for you to check with your neighbor and share with your neighbor, if you can, if you like to, uh, what is your research problem is it clear? Uh, did, you, did you bring something? Did you bring your, your chapter or your, your, your paragraph? If you didn't bring, then I, maybe you can think about it and write it. If you brought it, fish it out. Uh, I want you to just spend just five minutes looking at it. The reason for this is I want you to internalize what I said earlier on. I want you to apply and look at it. And you can also ask me questions if you are not sure. Okay? So just a couple of minutes, could you look at your own research question, your own hypothesis, your own uh, statement problem? Could you do that? Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, I see. I didn't know that. Okay.
結構グリップ。At this juncture, do you have any questions regarding the, this first chapter or your first introduction? Any, anything you want to ask? Yes. Oh, yes. It will be, uh, you'll be shared, I think. I understand it will be shared, right? Yeah. Yes. That's a good question. <laughs> Important question. Do you have any other questions? Yes, sorry. Oh, all right. <laughs> okay. Now, That's a good question. I'm afraid I cannot answer. You've got to check with your supervisor. Yeah, because where to position your hypothesis? Because different fields probably require different kinds of... Uh, uh, right. Oh, okay. So, yes, in that case, I can answer. I don't know, I thought you were from engineering or something. It's on the first chapter, the first introduction. Yeah, yeah. If you're from the social sciences, the hypothesis needs to be put in front, at the, in, the, in the front. After you, you, you put down the rationale, the background, why you're doing this, what, you, what kind of topic you're look, look, looking into, then almost immediately after that, you present your hypothesis. Yeah. Very much the same way you present your research question for those who are doing on qualitative. And some of you are doing mixed methods, similar situation. You have to put your research Uh, statement, if you like, the problem statement, which is actually a hypothesis. What are you doing at the end of the day at the front? Yeah, to be explicit about it. Yeah. Yes. Yes, you do have that. Yeah. So you list them out. I, I suppose you can if your, your first chapter is very thin, right? Would that be the case? Yeah. Okay. All right. I hope I hope you have got some ideas here. Uh, oops. I want you to look at the last line here. Um, are they phrased in a specific manner? Okay. The the word here is specific. Uh, sometimes we, f we phrase our research question or even our hypothesis in a very general way that's very difficult for us to, hand to put a handle on it, a finger on it. So in other words, you really have to be specific about the way you put your research question. If it's too broad, too general, you're not hitting anything. Okay? In fact, I was told that uh, this, even at the master's level or even at the doctorate level for that matter, This is your first research enterprise. Okay? You, 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 you can't do everything. You can't be a you know, super-duper researcher. You can't co accomplish everything. You're just starting out. This is your first taste, if you like, of good, serious research. So in other words, you have to, what we call, uh, fractured into a more specific, more concrete kind of uh, questions that you can achieve and answer rather than try to attempt to tackle a large issue. Okay? So again, go to your supervisor and check with him. Is this question specific enough? Otherwise, if it's too broad and too wide, you're going to hit, you know, you may not miss, you may, you'll miss hitting the, 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 the question. Okay? So that's, I thought this is important for us to, to take note of. Okay. Oops. I'm going to talk about lit review. What is this? I think you know what this is. Now, I'm a football fan. Okay. Now, lit review, it's really about this kind of things. Because I'm a football fan, people who are in the same, share the same interests, 
we can get together and talk about this guy. I know not a lot about him, but enough to talk about him. So in other words, when you, are, when you talk about lit review, it's how much you know about, in this case, Lionel Messi. <laughs> how up-to-date information do you have about this guy, or about soccer, or about football, or footballers for that matter? So lit review, in one sense of the word, is how much you know in your field that you have taken, you have chosen to research in. How much do you know? Is it up to date? Do you have the history behind it? What comes before this guy and before that guy who mentioned this and said that? So in a social sciences, lit review is very important. Because at the end of the day, all knowledge, as it were, is not new. What you're researching is has been done before in some other fashion or some other manner. You are just you are building on top of what other people have researched on, talked about. You are adding on, if you like. Unless you have some, you know, some special new knowledge that nobody has discovered or no, nobody has even researched in and you discover it or by all means. But I doubt it. Okay? Someone said there's nothing new under the sun. And it's quite true. Okay. I think it's Malcolm Margaret who said, all, all news is old news uh, done in a new way, <laughs> in a sense. Anyway, so in that sense, there's really nothing new under the sun. Okay? So that's lit review. So what is lit review for many of us, especially in the social sciences? <clears throat> Firstly, it undergirds your study. Undergirds means it is the basis, the foundation, why and what you're doing. Okay? You are almost like it's a platform for you to step on and say, look, I'm on this foundation here. This lit review here, I'm going to discuss about my research topic, about my research problem. So in other words, it informs your research questions. Again, it goes back to that. When you have your research question, formalized or formulated, you look at the lit review, how does it support or undergird your research questions? Each of your research questions must have some literature supporting it or arguing against it. And that's where you bring them all into this particular chapter. Okay? Secondly, it defines key terms that we all know. That's very basic. In fact, that's the most minimum requirement uh, of any research paper. At the master's level, this is mandatory. If you don't have that, you're in trouble. Um, <clears throat> but of course, we go more than that. You have to classify, organize the previous work, and at the same time, up-to-date current research. You've got to know what's currently, uh, up to, what's currently about your field. Okay? You've got to mention these things. It shows that you're on top of your field. For instance, my research topic is on distributed cognition. Whoa. Okay, it sounds strange, if you like, for some of us. But because it's a relatively new field, uh, I did a lit review, and there's just so much I can look at. In other words, if you ask me about distributed cognition, I can tell you what's the latest research on it, what's the latest trend, if you like, or what's the latest uh, paper on it, because I keep an eye out for it. It's almost like keeping an eye out you know, for things that you are interested in. You're always looking at it. I used to have a colleague in Japan. He's a psychologist uh, professor. He, he told me this. He said, I read three research articles every day. Wow. Three research articles every day to keep abreast of his field. I said, that's quite about right because I also read three articles every day, but mine is football articles. <laughs> in the morning, I open the Guardian about football. I go to Straits Times. I go to this website. That's why I read about football at least three articles per day. So the same for him, the same for me. But in a sense, I'm telling you, you have to keep abreast with what's going on in the particular topic and field that you're researching in and bring that into your research. In fact, I started doing my P, uh, the PhD four years ago, and my lit review changes because of new information. 
So the same for you guys. I don't know which stage you're in. Either you're the first year, second year, third year of your research. You have to bring in whatever is the latest. In fact, one of the examiners asked me, what is the latest in this field that you are researched in? So I had to answer that at my viver. Okay? Next point is discuss the main theories, schools of thoughts, strengths, and limitations. I think you know that. Now, I want to move on quickly to the next one. Discusses any controversial issues. Now, if there is a controversial issue, do not miss it. Do not skip it because your examiners will know. And in fact, you must bring it in. Because if you don't, it shows that you have you don't, you're neglected, you're ignorant of it. So any controversial issue that is in your field, you've got to include that in a section or a, a, a paragraph, in fact, a few paragraphs, talking about it and, of course, making your own position known at the end of the day. The next point also is important, and this is usually more important for doctorate studies. Reveals gaps in research that yours is filling. Now, masters, you don't really need to do that. The master's level, you just have to define the terms, what's current and what's going on, the strengths and limitations, and then that's your research. But for PhD, you really got to identify the gaps, the gaps in the lit review currently. And where does yours fit in? Where does yours help to bridge that gap? Now, if there's no gap, then you have, no, you have lost your significance. Do you see? There must be some gap. That's why you're researching into it. That's why you're looking into it. That's why you're filling it. You say, look, there's a gap here. I'm positioning my paper to fill that gap, that gap of knowledge that's missing. I'm giving you, I'm researching it, I'm producing it for you. Okay? And finally, this one, the last one, also it's for PhD students. You have, or at least, come up with a conceptual framework for your analysis. What is conceptual framework? It's almost like a model, if you like. But conceptual means concepts that you use, concepts that you bring in to your research. Okay? Concepts that you pick up from the lit review. A particular term, a terminology or words, a certain jargon that is used in your field. You bring that into your lit review and present it inside this chapter. So a conceptual framework is necessary to frame your research, to frame your design of your, of your uh, research, uh, your data collection and your analysis. Okay? So that's necessary for PhD students, really, a conceptual framework. In fact, at the end of the day, it's either you are testing a theory or you are building a theory. Okay? PhD students, you have to do either these two things. Either you are testing a theory, which is hypothesis, really, and the other one is building a theory, which is qualitatively, you look at stuff and then you bring them in and build a theory. You present a theory for others to test, <laughs> as it were. So you see how it goes round and round? Someone builds a theory, you test the theory. And you test the theory, so that you build a theory. Okay? So, at the PhD level, you're really doing this. You've got to go higher up. In fact, my supervisor was telling me, what theory are you building? What concepts have you come up with? You know, at a PhD level, you go higher. It's higher level. It's the higher level of thinking here. It's conceptual now. I'll give you an example. The word inflation, for example. If I say the word inflation, it's a concept. But when I say the word inflation, you immediately know what it means. Because it means, you know, whatever. Supply and demand, it goes higher. The cost of living goes higher. So a whole lot of ideas going on. But the, whole, the single word inflation triggers off a lot of meaning to you. At a PhD level, you have to come up with such concepts for your, I mean, at least for the social sciences. I'm not sure about the, yeah. You have to come up with some kind of concepts for you to present for your, uh, for, your, for, your, for your research, okay? So that's what I'm talking about. In your lit review, you use these concepts, you build on it, and you create new concepts for people to, to use and see. Or it could be a typology too, okay, for some of us in social sciences. Okay, let's look at the lit review here. This is a very standard lit review. Again, from the same research paper, the word internationalization is not new, but its use in education is relatively recent. So again, it's talking about what's, what's happening, what's current. Okay? Uh, okay, so here are the words. Here is how you write in, in one sense. Now, I want you to notice, which I'm going to talk about later on at the end, really, is the language. 
things that in the past was more commonly used. Okay? But later on, he brings into the present tense, refers to, so he brings it to the current discussion of the lit review. Okay? Do you get the idea here? Things that in the past you use past tense, but in the lit review you also use present tense also when you bring it into your discussion right now. You're discussing this concept right now. You, 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 you use present tense to, to discuss it. But this is a standard style which everybody, all of us here, I think need to uh, probably use it. Okay? okay, I've got a checklist here for your lit review, really. Now, even as, when I started on my lit review, I also use, you go back to your ruler, remember? This ruler. I've got to show it again because you will remember this. Go back to your research question, your hypothesis. Is it undergirded by lit review? In fact, every one of my research questions, which I had, I had four, each one of them is undergirded with a different set of lit review in order to support and understand why I'm doing this. Okay? Are there any counter-arguments, any weaknesses to this particular uh, uh, lit review you're talking about? What's your position? and that of your paper. Okay? Now, a lit review is not simply presenting what's current, but you're also presenting what you are saying too. Okay? So I'm going to talk about this here. Your position. Now, take a look at this. So you use words like this. In this research, collaborative learning is understood as a situation in which... Da -da 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 -da. This research view of extended cognition, this is my work actually, is that cognition is extended... So you present your position also from inside the lit review. So in other words, you're not just bringing what's out there, you bring it into your discussion, but at the end of the day, you're to say, my position on this particular concept, on this particular idea, the notions, this is what I'm setting forth in discussion in my paper. Okay? Now, the next line is, I, is it written in a storytelling or argument argument style. So many people present their lit review like he said this, he said that, she said this, they said that, and I said this. But it's just positioning what the different voices, if you like, are talking about. But what I want to put forth to you is that a good way of writing a lit review is really to write in an argument style. Okay? Look at the underlined portions. Internationalization in higher education is multifaceted. Now, he is making an argument, right? He's positing, making a statement. However, it is supported by Kalen 2000. So, in your argument, you use the lit review, the authors, what has been researched in the past to support your argument. Now, this is a better way to do your lit review, actually. That's what I've been told. <laughs> this is the way to suggest to your reader that you are not just simply bringing this author and that author into your lit review, but you are talking about your position, but supported by all these authors. Now you are making a stronger case in this sense. Okay? All right. This is another activity I thought I would like you to think about. Who? All right. Another Half an hour already. Can you look at, sorry, you should look at activity three. <clears throat> Not two. Uh, I think there's a, there's a missed, uh, there's a different alignment to the, to the pages. Activity three is actually the one you were looking at. Okay. Now, I don't know whether you have done your lit review before, uh, not yet, or you're still doing it, or you've done it. But in any case, I thought maybe uh, take a shot moment here for a few minutes for you to think about your lit review. How have you positioned your lit review? Look at the checklist that I've given you here on this page, all the questions here. Okay. And ask yourself, how is your lit review evaluated? Okay. You can talk to your friend next, next to you also, the same thing, and, uh, and just discuss about it. And just take a couple of moments. I want you to really think about your own, your own work right now. You know, the reason for this is because I don't want you to window shop. You know what's window shopping? 
you just go and just see, but you don't really want to buy. You're not really interested, but you just take a look. You know what I'm saying? You just window shop. I want you to be an interested buyer. You go in the shop, I really want to get this pair of pants or that blouse, and I really want to check out the size. That's what I'm wanting you to do. You're checking out your size <laughs> to, to what has been said. The point, check it out. Is it really, do I fit it? Does it fit me? You know, is this, is this point, does it fit my, 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 my lit review? Or is it something that, oh no, I don't need that, whatever. So I, I thought this is a couple of minutes for you to just take a moment to look at. And of course, if you have questions, please raise your hand. You can ask me at this point too. Okay, take a couple of minutes, maybe about four to five minutes. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Thank so you. I want to check that uh, if we just uh, write a paper for just paper for the journal, oh, you know, publication, yes. yeah, 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 publication, maybe only twenty page. So I think we cannot. Five thousand words, yeah. Yeah, we yeah. cannot cover the the hypothesis in the introduction and also in in later, and we cannot write a long literature review. So if for this case, any difference from what you said before? So Actually, no difference. <laughs> no difference? No difference. The reason being because there is, even if you write a paper, 5,000 words, okay, there is a section where you have to do lit review. In fact, all re research papers must have lit review because at the end of the day, you are also saying what is current, I'm bringing it into my position on my paper. Yeah, but, but, but the problem is, uh, I can't. In some sense, I, 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 I don't dare to use the literature review because I oh, think maybe I, I just cite several, okay. maybe even the, the most is the 10 people's words or argument. I can I use the literature review? Yes, you can, because I you're can? actually reviewing literature. Oh. What, what's happening at lit review is simply this. You're looking at other people's work and bring it into your paper. In fact, there's a beauty about this thing. It's called collaboration, by the way. Did you know that? You're actually using other people's ideas and work and put it inside yours and you collaborate with them to come up with your research, your findings. So there's a form of collaboration going on. And this is actually lit review. Uh, but may I have your suggestion yes. for if you just do a literature review and your hypothesis is just followed, if, if if it is you, if it were you, okay, uh, the title you will use like the literature review of some concept or the just the hypothesis. Oh, I see what you mean. What kind of a title? The, yeah. The title, the section for the section. Yeah, 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 Subheading, yeah. is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you may not use lit review if you don't want to. Yeah. You I'm sorry? You may not want to use the lit review uh, as yeah, a title. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's fine, actually. It's I've, fine. I've seen people don't do that, too. They just put the concept itself. Oh, okay. That means the, the, the concept that you are looking at. Okay. Yeah. But of course, underneath it, there are a lot of supports that you use. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Okay, thank yeah. you. Okay. So you're concerned about the use of the word literature review? Yes, because I think uh, too few. <laughs> okay. But in any case, you're also doing lit review. You're looking at other people's work and bring it in into your research. So that's actually lit review. You're reviewing other people's literature. Other questions or comments? Any other thoughts? I have the mic. I can bring it closer to you. So. Yes. Yeah. Uh, can I ask something? Because just now you mentioned the use of past tense and present oh, tense. So yeah, I was wondering actually which context you use present tense. Because in the past, when we were writing paper, we were told, like some of us yes. were told that you are supposed to write in past tense because the Examiner will always read it in the future and not like currently when I'm writing it. So I want mm. to clarify like okay. how to use it. Okay. Thank uh, you. Past tense, past tense, when do you use past tense and when do you use present tense in, in where? In the whole paper? Or like lit review, for example. Okay, in the section where you are reviewing other people's work, bring it in, when do you use past tense, when do you use present tense? Now, past tense are used when you are citing some work that is done in the past. Obviously, both of them are in the past. And then you bring them in and you talk about it. So X and Y uh, argued for this particular concept and Z counter-argued this. So all these are in the past tense. 
you bring in concepts that are in, uh, developed in the past, you report it as if it's in the past tense. Now, when do you use present tense? It's when you start positioning your own paper, your own ideas. So, it is where you start discussion. Now, actually, which is a, a section on discussion, uh, that's where you, all the present tense comes in. Because you're, you're discussing at the point of time your thoughts, your concepts with the author. Now, that's where the present tense comes in. Do you understand what I'm saying? Does it, does it make sense? So in a lit review, when do you use present tense? When you're bringing, when you're bringing in your own position. So this paper feels that X is right or Y is wrong, whatever, for example. So that's where the president comes in, when you're bringing in your own position. But apart from that, when you're just reporting what other people have done, talking about this point and that point, that's in the past tense. Okay? So in a, in a sense, it's a mixture. So it's not really, yeah, okay. So, okay, one more. Huh? Okay, one more. <coughs> Hello. Uh, in, your, in your checklist, uh, you mentioned that the mm. review should up today. Yes. And, uh, but uh, when we do research, we know some theories was developed maybe 200 years ago. Should, <laughs> yeah, should we go back to the root of the concept and uh, review the 200 years? Okay. Or just... just okay. Uh, so the question is, if someone has done a work 200 years ago, do you still go back to the... Yes. Now, it depends. Do you know what's a seminal work or seminal? Groundbreaking. The first guy who created it, that idea, that everybody keep using it for ever, ever. <laughs> that one you need to quote. That one you must quote, because that's the first guy who gave you that first concept. That one, yes, you must bring it in. If it's so seminal or seminal, the way you pronounce it, the most important work, groundbreaking work, you must quote that. Yeah. If you have that in your field, the topic that you're researching in, obviously. But if there isn't any, that means here and there people add in and all kind of stuff, you don't really have to quote that. Uh, what I did was, you can have someone else who actually talked about all these previous people you use them to kind of like describe all these others. Uh, that's what I did too. You can do that. Yeah. But you don't have to quote someone who is not so important, someone that is just, you know, yeah, 20, 200 years ago. In fact, more importantly, it's not so much all the dated and old uh, discoveries, concepts, but what's really up to date is more important. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's one more up there, right? Yes? Yes. Yeah, just one more question. We'll just take one more before then I move on to my next set of slides. I know. It's always a confusion there. In fact, when I, when I review papers, people are confused whether to put present tense or past tense in which section now. Now, this is the section he's talking I think you're referring to the finding section. Reporting what you have. Yeah, the results. Now, that one has to be in past tense. Because it happened in the past. I did this laboratory testing. I did this testing. I surveyed 1,000 people. Those are all in the past. Last week, last year, whatever it is. Those, whatever you report in your finding section, it's all, often, if not all the time, must be in the past tense. Because you report what happened in the past. Methodology, you report what happened in the past. But discussion, when you're bringing in your, your findings, you discover certain concepts. These are my findings. This is currently what I believe to be true, or yes, this one then you have to discuss in the present tense. Do you see the distinction? I hope you can see the distinction. Things that you see in the past, past tense. But you bring it now to discuss currently, 
in your thesis, these must be in present tense. Yeah. So I hope that's very clear. Yeah. So usually in a discussion chapter, most of the time it's present tense, unless you're referring to the past, your experiments and all. Then you use past tense. But when you start discussing, it's present tense. Okay? All right, let's move on then. Because we still have time for questions at the end. But let me clear my slides so that you have an idea. Um, methodology now. Okay, this is the part, the, the third area that I want to uh, spend my time looking into. Locating your methodology in a paradigm. Anyone knows what is this idea of paradigm? Is this something new to you? Maybe? Okay, we'll talk about a bit more about that. So, paradigm, I'll, I'll come back to the slide later on. Paradigm is this, the uh, <clears throat> epistemology. Means what? How you see knowledge is understood. How do you understand knowledge? How do you perceive knowledge? Okay? So Kuhn, now this is a, uh, this is uh, 1970, not 200 years ago, but it's an important guy. The scientific method. Those who are in the science, the hard science, this is your man. T. Kuhn, okay. The scientific method. That's a classic starting of the scientific community, how they start. Uh, anyway, the entire constellation of beliefs, values, techniques shared by members of a given scientific community. So in your community, in your field, what is being shared? Okay. What is the paradigm there? What, how do they see, understand knowledge? <clears throat> Usher said this, the study of how knowledge is constructed about the world, who, is, who constructs it, and what criteria they use to create meaning and methodology. Now you might say, what's all this? What is this paradigm thing? Don't we all share the same paradigm? Question is, what is this? Okay, I will answer this to you. What do you see here? Oh, it's a bit blurred, this, this slide, but I think you can make it out. What do you understand this to be? Can you just shout the answer out? Garbage, okay. Can drink, okay. Empty can drink. Empty beer bottle. A beer can, sorry. I must say a beer, right? Must be. Garbage. Someone say garbage. To an alcoholic, this is some, what I drank last night. Okay, so here is where I want you to understand how we see and construct knowledge. Essentially, there are two groups. Okay? The positivist <clears throat> and the interpretive. Is this new to you? I hope not. <laughs> now, the master's level, this is, may not be so crucial for you, but it's good to, for you to know. Positivist means, if I look at the can, all of us must see that this is a crushed tin can of a drink. That means there's only one objective view of this slide. And all of us must see that, must arrive at that. No questions asked. Okay? That's the objective view. Any other interpretations is wrong. <laughs> it's not correct. You got it wrong. Okay? But however, just now I ask you, some of you say, garbage. So that's a different interpretation. It's not a tin can, not a used, empty beer can, but rather it's garbage to you. Okay? So in that sense, you have the, the other perspective. So this is how the world at this point of time understands the way we see knowledge. Okay? The positivist sees knowledge as value-free, objective, they are all facts, and they are independent observer. Okay? But the interpretive or relativist see differently. Everything has value. Okay? So just now the tin can was garbage to me. So there's some value. Some value attached to that comment or that the way I see the knowledge, or I see the tin can. It's subjective. There's meaning. And the observer is not independent. That means I'm not outside, but I'm also part of what is being observed. Do you see? So these are the two contrasting views, if you like, the way we see the world. Now, I don't know which, which one you take, but normally, for the scientific community, of course, the first one. 
That's why the science will say gravity, the law of gravity is universal. Okay? But it's not true when you get into outer space. In that sense. All right? So, of course, uh, there are two others, critical theory and feminist. I won't talk much about that, but just a list here to show you that these are two other views that emerged out of uh, these two common views. But what does this mean for us? Okay, that's more important. Now, if you are a positivist, most likely you will use empirical studies. Do you see how? Do you see how it, it kind of like lead to your design of your methodology? If you see the world has objective, that means there must be some objective value, uh, uh, some objective uh, ideas that everyone must subscribe to, you've got to use quantitative. It's a testing. Okay? So you'll be experimental. In fact, sometimes you use survey to see the numbers. So for example, today, okay, today there's about 90 people here. That's quantitative. That's objective. That's it. I don't care whether the 90 understood anything or not. <laughs> or learn anything, but there's 90 people who attended this lecture, tick, well done. That's objective, empirical value. Okay? And usually large size. So people who do positivist paradigm, they, us they usually look at large size. That means large group surveys. But the interpretivists or the relativists are more qualitative. That means they're generating ideas. That means they pick, okay, I see this person doing this, this, doing that, doing that. Perhaps there's some trend going on there, some kind of pattern. So they're generating theory, generating ideas or principles. Okay? So again, you use observation, you interview people to get the meaning, you do survey, you do field work. Okay? Just a bit of work about field work. Field work means you go out there and see the people, what they do, or see things. Usually it's for social science, because social means dealing with people. Okay? Whereas the positive naturally will do with the natural, physical world. Okay. So that's indication or the kind of implication to the kind of paradigm you use to attend to your research design. Okay. So I thought this is interesting for us to take notes because uh, it's really what kind of approach you take. Yeah? What, are you, what, kind of, uh, what kind of paradigm are you taking when you do your research? And in a PhD level, you have to justify you have to say, look, I'm objective about this. This is experimental. I am not involved. Okay? So you must argue for that. But if you're doing natural science, it's quite easy because you're looking at inanimate objects. But you're looking at social beings, social things, it's a bit, a bit difficult. Right? Because in, naturally you'll be involved. You are not an un -ob uh, independent observer, as it were. Okay? Because the fact that you interview someone you are interfering with the information, the data. Okay? So these are things that you meet, need to be, be careful about. So my, for this, the checklist for methodology and research design is really this. What is your research paradigm? Okay? Does it matter? Yes, it does. You have to explore it a bit, discuss a little bit about it, and start to say, okay, this is my research design, and therefore, these are my research questions or my hypothesis, if you like. Is it aligned to the chosen? Is it aligned to your paradigm? Okay. And the collection, the data collection methods. Earlier on, I'm, I mentioned to you, sorry, if you are positivist, you have to use quantitative results. It's just classic. Okay. Empirical results. Because it's not, there's no value involved. But if you're interpretive, you've got to look at how people understand the meaning behind things. Okay? So are these aligned? So these are the questions that it's posed to you when you are looking at your methodology. And in fact, there's one section, in fact, you have to discuss about this. Okay? Which will also mean your research is there in terms of the sampling. Okay? Control, un controlled environment or non-controlled environment? What kind of stuff are you... You've got to describe all these things to fit the paradigm that you're using. Okay? Okay, so at this section, you have to look at also um, describing your methods of collection. How did you go about collecting your data? 
Also describe your analysis approach. What do you use? Any models are you using uh, to analyze? And SPSS for some of us doing survey or coding for some of us who are doing qualitative. Okay. And then the issues of validity, reliability, or trustworthiness. Now, the first two is for the positivists, people who are looking at the empirical studies. Okay. How valid is your findings? How valid are your results? Is it reliable? That means, can I repeat your results? If I do it today, is it the same result as you had done it two months ago? So that's validity and reliability. You need to state these things. You need to ensure that there are such things, measures in place to ensure the validity and the reliability of the findings. Whereas on the other side, the qualitative side will be trustworthiness. It's not about validity and uh, reliability anymore. It's can I trust when you collect the data, it is what it is supposed to be. It's about trustworthiness. Okay, this one you can look at uh, a lot of literature about it. And then ethics. I don't know whether you talk about ethics. Okay, at a PhD level, ethics is important. <laughs> that means your consent, the consent you get from your participants. If you're dealing with human beings, especially if you're dealing with children, consent is very important. Okay? Uh, access to the site. Do you have agreement from the people who are you know, uh, in charge of uh, whatever the area that you're going into to do the research? So the ethics issue must also be discussed and, and talked about and, re and you can talk about your limitations and the shortcomings if you like. Okay? But ethics also must be mentioned. So this is one of your checklists that you need to look at. And the generalizability, can you generalize your findings? If yes, say it. Okay? That's the significance. If no, why not? So these are the things that you need to talk about and any limitations to your results, any limitations to your experiment, any limitations to the way you collect your data, all these must be upfront. In fact, I was told you should be upfront as much as possible rather than think that your, your research was perfect. Okay? You mustn't say it's perfect because there's no such thing as a perfect experiment. There are always some problems, issues. Like today, the air conditioning is not working. You must mention that. When I was doing the experiment, the air conditioning did not work. So I need to cater for certain things, just off the cuff, okay? But ideas are like this. You have to state your limitations. Because when you do that, people can see that your experiment or your uh, findings is real. They are real. It's, 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 it's contextualized. You know, it's not something that is uh, created out of uh, nothing. Okay? Um, here it's, again, from the same research article, uh, this is where this person talked about his paradigm. Can you see? In the same research paper, they state their own paradigm in the research. This interpretive study was rooted in the <clears throat> epistemological belief that social reality is constructed by people who participate in it and it's constructed differently by different individuals. So again, use a support. Reality is thus viewed as subjective. Okay? So these are the supports that you can use. These are the ways that you state your paradigm in your research. Okay, let's talk about a little bit about data analysis and findings. So when you come to this stage, it's really about looking at your findings and classifying them and organizing them. Uh, looking for relationships, Compare, some people call it comparison and contrasting the method, okay? uh, and using visuals to present your findings. Now, there's a, there's, a, there's a research done that when you're doing more science research papers, there are more graphs. Okay? Social science uh, research papers has less graphs, as it were. Okay? Except for technical papers, they say maybe less graphs. But anyway, these are some, some things that you need to present your findings on. But this is quite straightforward, this part. This is where your findings comes in and you just present them. Okay. Finally, well not finally, the second last chapter will be discussion. This is where you interpret your findings. You show how you have addressed your research questions again. It comes back. Your hypothesis, your research questions. How did all these things fit in? And then 
you discuss it with your lit review, it comes back one full circle. Bring in your lit review that you talked about, the key people, bring it in and in your discussion right here. And finally, in your discussion, show how your research have contributed, challenged, and proved your argument. So this is how you end, as it were, your whole thesis before you've, you end off in your conclusion. Okay? So conclusions, implications, and recommendations are usually the last part that anybody would write, and usually it's the, some people say it's the easiest, but not really so. When I did my conclusions, implications, it took me a long time because I need to crystallize and synthesize all your findings into something that is easy for your reader to understand. Okay? So apart from summarizing your main findings, you need to state how they address your research questions. Do you see how the ruler comes back again and again? Because your examiners will, re will examine and review your thesis based on your research questions, based on the things that you set forth that you want to achieve at the beginning. And then you evaluate your research to the contribution to the current body of knowledge, state the implications of your outcomes and then recommendations to practice policy and further research. All these parts need to spend some time thinking about it, but I would, I would, I would think this would be quite easy in a sense because uh, the hard part is really the discussion part. All your findings, how do you crystallize it, how do you organize it and synthesize it to make it in a way that presents itself as a worthy, that you have added on to the body of knowledge in your field. That's the harder part, actually. Okay? Oh, okay. Just a little bit on the writing style and the register. I think I mentioned a bit earlier on, um, on the past tense when describing methodology. Uh, we talked about it. Okay, the lit review, present tense in discussion, and in conclusions, by the way. Conclusions are written in the present tense. Because you currently, this are your currently, what you currently conclude about your own research. At this point of time, this is what I believe to be true and to be right and to be good. Okay, that's your present tense for your discussion and conclusion part, the last part. Of course, recommendations and implications are all either in the present tense or in the future tense. Okay? Okay, when to use your own voice. I thought this one is interesting. How do you understand the word your own voice? I mean, your own voice, yeah? <laughs> your, yes, using I, using we. Some people say this research, this thesis. So what do you use? When do you use? Can you use I? No. <laughs> yes. When do you use I or when you cannot use I? Interesting, isn't it? Now, I was told that generally you try not to use I because you are not an expert. Okay, you're not. However, you can use I at certain places, especially in methodology. Why? Because that's what you did. Do you get it? That's where you did. You conducted the experiment, you did the survey, you interviewed people, you can use I. Okay? And when you use I, you give your own voice to the research. Okay? This is what I did. Okay? My classes, my experiment was this. So you lend yourself your own voice in this particular area. I'm going to show you a little bit about your own voice. Okay? Now, in methodology, okay, I mentioned that. Sampling the experiment. Okay? Um, so my site, my site of research, my area of research, okay? This is all my eye can come in. In the literature review, your voice can come in too, which I call your critical voice. What is critical voice? That means you have evaluated on the lit review and this is your position. So in this case, your critical voice is expressed as the research, this thesis, okay? So this research suggests, this research maintains, posits, this position. So this is your critical voice, in fact. Your voice is expressed via or through the research, through your thesis, using those words in a way to express it. Okay. Now in discussion and conclusion, your expert voice can come in. Ah. So don't forget, you do have an expert voice. When does your expertise come in? It's after you have finished your findings, you have finished analyzing, 
Now, you are an expert, actually, in your own findings. Do you realize that? Nobody else has privy or understand your research better than yourself. And this is where you can come in to say your own position. And that's where your expertise, as it were, come into your research. So, so that is your expert voice, especially in a discussion and conclusion. In fact, you must say with authority. Especially in the recommendation part, I, I, sometimes I write, I recommend this, 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 this. Or you can say this research suggests strongly that further research needs to be done in this particular area because... Da, 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 da. So this is your expert voice comes, coming in. And you need, to be, you need to say in such a way that also at some time suggests some authority behind what you're saying because based on your research. So that's your expert voice. Now the last one that I want to talk about really is the weaving of voices. What is this weaving of voices? That means at some point in your... This is usually in the lit review where you have so many authors coming in and talking. So in other words, when you cite someone, you quote someone, these are people saying their own positions. So you're weaving in between them. Okay? And sometimes you can come in on your own. Let me show you an example. No, this is your voice. Sorry. Can I just show you the, your voice? Okay? This is your voice. This is in the area of uh, uh, suggesting limitations to your research. Okay, let me just back, back up a bit. Okay? Your voice, all right? So I say, as an insider researcher, da 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 da, okay? I was mindful not to reveal any of my own thoughts about the same matter. So this is your voice, okay? Personal voice in your research. This is your critical voice. This research argues for the cognitive system. So this is your critical voice in your research. You can, you can use that. As such, it seeks to enlighten. So what is your research going to do? This is your voice. Your research, critical voice in your research, in your discussion. Okay? Ah, this is the weaving of voices. Now, can you see? So L and F observed. Da 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 da. Holland, Hutchins, and Kish, uh, Kish opined that. Da da da. So these are all past tense. Can you see? This is in a past research. Some may argue, okay, so bringing the discussion on, 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 onto, the, onto the present tense, that cognition is non-symbolic. This is present tense. Right now, I'm talking about, now, perhaps cognition can be non-symbolic discussion, therefore cannot be studied. This is, I'm bringing it into the current discussion. While others like Glasser and Key believed, so going back to the past, so can you see the weaving of voices? Different authors coming in to talk about a particular idea or notion that you're discussing, and the past tense, present tense coming in, and the weaving of voices from different... And obviously, obviously, in the end, you have to make your own position. Okay? So these are the weaving of voices. Okay, that's it. That's all I have, really. Okay, now it's question time, really. Yeah. Yes? Ah, if it's only you are the only author of your thesis, it's always I. But, but, but the, the, the truth is that when I read the paper, I never see I. I only see you. We, it's because they may have a team. Do you have research? Uh, do you have a research team with you? Are you? Uh, do you have a team of people? Yeah. Uh, then, no, I suggest it's always I. I. Yes. Yeah. Unless you have a team of uh, researchers. Uh, you were part of a team that researched, but you are writing this paper only. Do you understand what I'm saying? Your research was done as a team, but even though you're the only author, ah, you can use we, but because you are, but you must mention that earlier on that this is part of your. It was a larger team, uh, a bigger project that you went in to do the research. Yeah, but when you write, you can use I, but when you refer to the project, it's we. It's possible. Yeah. So it's again the weaving between the research team and yourself in the research presentation. Yeah. Do you have any other questions? Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, just just uh, one, one small thing. I just want to make an announcement. Uh, the, they are setting up the tables for the snacks and lunch after this <laughs> session. Okay, It's probably going to take about 10 minutes That's your, or so. That's your so feel free to engage with the speaker for the next 10 minutes or so so that 
you know, things will be ready by the time you go out. Okay. I just want to mention that lunch will be served. Okay. Yes. Please go yes. ahead. Sorry. In the what? Sorry. Abstract. Abstract of the work. Abstract. Oh, in the abstract. Okay. The f first part. Usually third person. Third person. Yeah. Usually. Yeah. No, it's, there's, no, there's no need for you to use your own personal voice in uh, in abstract because abstract. The abstract essentially is for people to have a glimpse, a quick glance and glimpse on what you have done. In fact, the abstract is about everything. Do you realize that? Your research aims, purpose, also a bit about your methodology, a bit about your findings, a bit about your findings, and also your recommendations to be possible. Abstract is really a gist, a snapshot of all the thing about the key points about your research for them to consider whether they want to publish it or to want to further read about your research yeah. so in fact it has everything so but usually it's in the third voice uh, third person yeah yeah no. any other questions yes. sorry i can't I using can't. the phrase oh, the author instead of saying i is that okay? Is that a question? Okay. The question is, of course, how detached you want to be from your research. <laughs> Usually, when you say the author, it means you're, you, you, you're taking a step back and say, this author is saying this. Not really me, but the author is saying this. So, so how personal you want to be with your research? I think that's the question you have to ask yourself. Most of the time, nowadays, people like to use I. Yeah, personalize your research. This is your research. Uh, express it in that way. Because uh, the author suggests there's a distance. Yeah. But generally nowadays people use the first person coming in a lot more. Yeah. Any other? Yes. Um, you discussed the paradigm and you, you discussed positivism, sorry, and, yeah. uh, and uh, post positivism. However, um, I've uh, heard that, what? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, I've heard that um, you're su it's stronger to actually mix both paradigms in your writing, like quant qualitative plus quantitative, and yes. you know using empirical plus uh, uh, participatory, yeah. observational, that kind of thing. Um, that that's a good comment, but uh, but if you realize that the positivist and the interpretivist, they are actually at opposite ends. One side says there's really no objective truth out there. All of us are like, you know the story about this elephant with the blind man? Each one is just feeling one part of the elephant, but they don't really have the full picture. That's the in, in, interpretive's uh, position. Whereas the positive say, there is an elephant. I can describe to you. There is a classic elephant shape I can describe to you. That's the positive. So you, you, actually, you can't, you can't, both will collide. Now, when you talk about people using qualitative and quantitative, do not confuse with the idea that quantitative equal the uh, objective view only. Even quanti qualitative uh, research, you use also numbers. You can use numbers. Now, the thing is really this. Which one is primary? Even in mixed methods people use for research, which one is primary? Some people use the empirical as the primary, but the qualitative has subsidiary just for more deeper understanding. But the key is really the empirical study. Do you understand what I'm saying? In mixed methods, there is still something that uh, dominates. One method dominates the other, but you're using both. No doubt about that. But some people use qualitative, but they do some little survey just to get a feel. But the key is qualitative because I want to understand the meaning, the interpretations of my participants. I'm not really interested in all the, the, the constructs, if you like, or the factors, they call it. In qualitative, we call it influences. But in the empirical studies, we call factors. So these are some of the terms that people use. Uh, so in one sense, when you talk about mixed methods, one will precede or o override the other as the key. Yeah. So you have to support one or the other. You can't give equal weight to both. Yeah, you can't, actually. Okay. You'll be questioned on that. What do you mean? I mean, so are you are you interpreting this thing? Is 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 this? 
Because the interpretive position is relativist. Everything is relative. There's no real truth. Every one of us is having a shade of it, that's all. So you cannot approach it and say, yes, there is, and yet there isn't any. Yeah. So, so, so if you're doing an interpretive position, you can include a positivist element as one of the many truths that lie available to you? Not, not really. Not, not really. really yeah. okay. But however, let me just qualify that. If you go into the literature, you'll find that the positivist position has moved to post. Yeah. So they think that, okay, perhaps not all of us can really see the ultimate truth, but we can almost approximate it. So you see a compromise going on? Whereas the interpreters positions, now they move towards the more positive position. Yeah, maybe there is something that we can all commonly agree to be the common truth, as it were. But still, you know, we're still figuring it out. See, that's the, that's the amazing thing about what's, what, how people see or construct knowledge or understand truth or understand uh, facts and figures, as it were. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, you can't, you can't have both at, a, at the same tandem. Uh, it, it, you're going to be open for questioning. And I don't know how you're going to justify it unless you're very good at, you know, weaving it and uh, making it such that you can actually get away with it. But, but I've seen most articles, they are usually either one is on the dominant front and the other one is on the other. So post-positivist position is often cited as one of the positions that most empirical studies will take on. Yeah. Oh, so post-positive is not the same as interpretive, is that what you're saying? No, it's not. Okay, no, okay, yeah. okay. Got it, it is saying that there is it. an ultimate truth yeah. There is some real, you know the Plato philosophy, yeah. there is an ideal chair. This is not an ideal chair, but there's an ideal chair out there. It's just that we don't <laughs> haven't arrived at it yet. <laughs> These are all different forms of chairs, variation of chairs, that's trying to reach to the ideal shape of a chair. So the same idea there. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, it's a conundrum in that area. So many uh, ideas and thoughts about it. So you, so you have to believe quite strongly in one or the other. Yeah, you can't be wishy-washy. No, you well, okay, okay. That's, Yeah, you shouldn't be. Okay, okay. Thanks. Okay. Well, that's a good question about uh, paradigm. How's the how's the what? I think the recall the basic result in the introduction. The basic result in the introduction. No. Introduction part do not involve any of the findings or your conclusion. It should not, because it's not meant to be. Yeah. Yeah, you, uh, you, 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 can't, you can't let them taste uh, your final product before let them finish reading it until they come to your final product. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, what's the difference between the object and the conclusion of a paper? Let's see. What's the difference between abstract and? And the conclusion. And the conclusion. And the conclusion. A big difference. Yeah. The abstract is just, well, like a better description, the abstract is just the, uh, the short form, if you like, the abbreviation. Abstract actually is the abbreviation of all your chapters. By the way, you've got to recognize that. It is a bit of your introduction, the key points of introduction, the key points about your lit review, key points about your findings, key points about your discussion, key points about your conclusions, and even recommendations and implications. So that's the abstract. It's a bit of everything uh, abs abstracted, as it were, in a short form for people to understand and see without reading your entire thesis to have a quick understanding of what, you're, what, what it's all about. Conclusion, on the other hand, doesn't, it's, it's, it is also going back to all your research question, your starting point, argument, and how you, whether you've achieved your uh, uh, research questions or not. Yes, it is also about that, but you don't really go into lit review anymore. You don't really go into your findings anymore because conclusions about your conclusions about your discussion, your final discussion. Yeah. So if you want to say the conclusion does not have your lit review because your lit review is discussed in the discussion, right? You only have uh, your, a bit of your introduction, okay? Your framework, why you started with this uh, uh, research. Your research questions, did I achieve it? Did I finish it? Did I do it? How well did I do it? These are my outcomes, my significance of my studies, and your implications and recommendations to the society or the body of knowledge that you've contributed to. So, yeah. So that would be the difference uh, as far as I did my thesis. 
Uh, excuse yeah. me. Oh, yeah. uh, just now you mentioned that uh, when your thesis advisor read your thesis, they feel very enjoyable. So yeah. can you share how, how do you make your thesis very uh, good at the read? Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. okay. It goes back to what I, one of my slides I say, I say that it has to be like a, telling a story. Everybody loves a good story, yes? So, so is your research thesis. It's really a story. It's a story about how you fell in love with your research topic, how it becomes so enchanting and so and all embracing that you spend your days and nights looking at your results, getting a, collecting your data. It's all about that. A love story, if you like, about your research topic, about your hypothesis, about your research questions, and how you went about getting the results, coming up with the outcomes, and finishing up with a beautiful concept almost building a theory for everyone to see that this is so that's that's what it's all about yeah so I, I try to structure it in that way so yeah in that sense they yeah. so really it's about arguing your case making it a story so it's nice to read enjoyable and it helps them to understand about the your field okay yeah next uh, hello I want to ask a question about the literature review okay uh, <laughs> Uh, how can we select the articles that we want to cite it in the literature review if we have many articles to uh, we can cite uh, about one sentence one one sentence one opinion one article I mean yeah okay what articles one, one opinion we have many articles can cite it yeah so how can we select the now, few articles if, if you really review all the articles you will notice that there's a trend appearing. Meaning what? There's always this guy who's always being quoted. There's always this person who's being used over and over again. That's the guy you want to hold on to. Grab him, get his article, read his article, and use him. Now that's one my, my suggestion. That's what I did, actually. Because there are just so many people talking about so many things. Now grab the guy who started it all, as it were. The culprit. Okay? Uh, yeah. So what if our our research may be a little concentrate, concentrated on one uh, on one article that is not so well cited? Uh, uh, you mean mm. uh, frequently so, cited? Okay. So can we uh, cite that article instead? Uh, I mean, is it will influence our quality of the li literature review? I'm afraid it will. If it's something that's unknown, obscure, but you use them as part of your Remember I say it undergirds your research. Undergirds means your, your foundation. That's, the, that's the, the, the reason why you, you, you're using this to base your research on. So if you have someone who is not really that, uh, like a better word, famous, uh, it's going to be a problematic. Yeah, because your, your examiner will ask you, why didn't you cite this other guy? Yeah. So you really have to do your due diligence, they call it, your work into looking at your literature. Which ones, which are your giants, if you call That's a good word. What are your, who are your giants in your field? Cite them. These are your guys. In my case, there are a few guys that I know. After you read so many, you know which are the key guys, who started it, who are the ones who made huge contribution to it. Those are the guys you must latch on because your examiners will know. Because they have gone before you. They've gone before you. They've they read about it more, much more than you, so they will know. So if you don't cite them, you don't use them, you're in trouble. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any, Any others? Uh, I oh. have a question. Oh, if I can okay. ask. I'll ask it on behalf of my graduate students. All right. Uh, many of them tell me they find writing the introductory chapter to be the most difficult. Oh, really? Yeah, they always start with the methodology, discussions, results, conclusions. They finish all that, and then the last thing they attempt is writing the introductory chapter. I don't know if senior uh, graduate students here will agree with uh, uh, this, but many of my students have said this. So is that a good way or, uh, you know, <laughs> is it not the best way or why is this happening? You know, if you can... Oh, that I, <laughs> I really don't know why this is happening. But usually, usually the introduction uh, will be the, the first thing you will write for the very reason you are, you are telling the story about your research interest, your, your question, why you went into it. And uh, started, you start looking at it from a starting point, the introduction. You're introducing your research. So, so that would be the first chapter. In fact, it's the first chapter I wrote. 
Yeah. But after that, you come back to it and you vi- revisit it and, and make changes. Sure. Yeah. But so I don't know why. Uh, okay. It's the hardest to write, but. Yeah. Okay. In the interest of time, we will yeah. stop here. Please join me in thank- thanking Mr. Jeffrey. Thank you for being here. Thank you.